to our worship at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Issaquah. Uh, this online experience we've been working with for, with for a few weeks. I hope that you're finding it uh, meaningful to you as you figure out how to live under these circumstances these days. I'm Jim Cruzzi, pastor here, and um, this is the second Sunday of Easter, the Sunday after the resurrection of our Lord. I invite you to uh, be sure that you are, have had a chance to refer to the email that comes along with this video. Uh, you'll see there an order of this service that you can look at as we go along. You'll also see ways to connect with one another, opportunities to stay connected within the community. And I also to invite you to continue to um, find ways to support this ministry with your contributions. Uh, you, you'll see an opportunity to do that either online or through envelopes. So, um, so we continue now into this uh, opening service, this service for the second Sunday of Easter. Alleluia! Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Alleluia! The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Or let 
your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with him, with an oath to him, that he would put one of his descendants on the throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. A family is shut into their house because of what's going on outside. None of them really knows how dangerous it is. Anyone or no one could touch them. Anyone or no one could walk too close to them or just breathe on them, and it would all be over. If any single one of them goes outside, the whole house is in jeopardy. Eventually, someone has to go out. Someone has to have the courage to do the essential work. Someone has to pick up the groceries. Somebody has to go to the drugstore and get the mail. Even though he knows the danger that, of going out, they cannot all stay shut in the rest of their lives. Even though this scenario may sound familiar to you, I'm not talking about your family, I'm not talking about my family, I'm not even talking about some sort of composite of all of the families up and down the street where you live. I'm talking about 
talking about the disciples of Jesus. I'm talking about that family, the friends of Jesus, who after living and eating and traveling with him for more than three years have become a family of their own. It's Easter morning. And these are not the women of these are not those who got up early and went out to visit the tomb and found out that the tomb was empty. These are the ones who ran away at the crucifixion of their friend. These are the ones who have pulled up in, the, in their house to shield themselves from the same fate. No one knows who knows them out there in the world. Who might uh, no one knows who might recognize them as a friend of Jesus. No one knows who in the crowd who call for Jesus' crucifixion will call for them to be arrested and put to death. No one knows who will recognize them and turn them in or who will pass by with a smile and a wave and say, hello. Better that they stay put. Better that they stay shut in. For the disciples of Jesus, this is a critical moment in their lives. Their lives are at risk. They need a moment to take a breath, to let this pass, to let the danger subside, to let things get back to normal. But what the disciples don't understand is that they have often that what they are experiencing has always been this way. No one ever really knows. Who will recognize us in the world? No one ever knows who knows us and who does not. No one ever knows who means us harm or who will pass by with a wave and a smile. Every day of our lives, every day of our lives, we walk out the door. We put our lives at risk. What makes this moment different for the disciples is that it is not just that life or a single life is at risk, what makes this moment different is that a way of life, a way of being in the world is coming to an end. Jesus had introduced them to a life where God is alive and active, where God is walking among the sick and the, sick and the scared and the lost and the powerless, where God in Christ is healing them and encouraging them giving them forgiveness and giving them hope. But now Jesus is God, and life as they know it is gone. What difference does it make if they go back into the world or if they stay shut up in their house? What are they going to do if they do? Faced with an overwhelming fear of their future, Hiding out behind locked doors, the risen Jesus appears to them out of nowhere with a word of peace, a breath of life, a charge to go back out and live the life that he has taught them to live in spite of the circumstances. If you forgive the, any, the sins of any, Jesus says, they will be forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. When their friend miraculously stands before them, John tells us the disciples did not say, hey, how did you get in here? They didn't say, come down, sit down, have something to eat, we know you must be hungry. They didn't say, we don't know where, where you've been, but can we go home, can we get out of here? It's too scary to stay in Jerusalem. God doesn't tell us any of the words that the disciples said to Jesus. John just says that they that their outlook had been dramatically changed. Their view of their future was different now. They were now full of joy. John says they rejoiced. The problem is that one of them had, been, had more courage than the rest. One of them had abandoned the security of locked doors and stepped out to buy the groceries. Thomas had already figured out that things were 
were never going to be the same. Thomas had the courage to act when the others did not. Because he had the courage to believe, to trust that life goes on. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to be the first one out the door. This is only the fourth Sunday that we have been holed up in our homes, unable to come out of our busy lives, to take a few hours on the first day of the week to come together, to encourage one another, to worship and praise God for our blessings. This is only less than a month that we have been able to been unable to do this, but who's counting? Time has stopped. Who knows what time it is? At first it was about safety and care for those who were more vulnerable, those who could catch the disease most easily. But then it was about getting by, keeping our essential services going, figure out who's going to get the groceries and who's going to get the gas, who's going to keep our shelves stocked. But then it was about weathering the storm, getting the work of our lives back going, getting, the, getting a new way to, to accomplish things we needed to do from the seclusion of our home or getting financial relief to those who couldn't. But now, now it's about something different. Now it's about something deeper. Now it's about something scarier. It's not just about when we will get back to life as we know it. It's about if we ever will. No one knows what working is going to look like when we get out. No one knows what teaching or learning will look like. No one knows what shopping will look like. No one knows what going to church will look like. No one knows what life will look like. It's a new world. We should not underestimate the timidity of the disciples who, when, what they were when they were experiencing their world collapsing around them. Nor should we treat lightly the courage of Thomas as he faced his own new future head on. The fear that the disciples were feeling is the same fear that has always threatened to overwhelm us every day. In ordinary times, it is ordinary fear. The fear of failure or the fear of rejection or the fear of embarrassment. But now there are bigger fears. There are fears for the safety of our family living in dangerous times. There's fear for ourselves, for illness, for loss of those we love. Fear for being found out that we really are not the person we present to the world. That we have to adjust the way we are seen. In order to get the story straight about Thomas, we need to listen carefully to his words. The world named Thomas the Doubter, but John tells us that Thomas's real nickname was the Twin. We are not that we were not there to see what Thomas and the rest of the disciples saw. Thomas is our eyes. Thomas is our witness to what was going on. Without Thomas and his stubborn demand to see evidence of Jesus' death, then we who cannot see may never have received the gift of faith. We need Thomas. Thomas does not ask to see the signs of resurrection. Thomas does not say, unless I can feel the warmth of the breath on my skin. Thomas doesn't say, unless I can put my ear to his beating heart, I will not believe. Thomas has no problem believing in the resurrection. It is assumed these guys had seen men who were born blind, able to watch the birds winging through the sky. They had seen a young boy's lunch be used to feed thousands and thousands of people. 
They have seen Jesus, their friend, standing with Elijah and with Moses and hearing the word of God speak to them that this is my son. God said, this is my beloved son. No, Thomas has no problem with resurrection. What Thomas needs to see is the signs of crucifixion. He needs to see where they drove the nails through his hand and where they ran a spear through his side. He needs to see that his Lord and his God really was a human being, totally, completely, fully. He had to be sure that the one in whom he was going to put his trust had faced up to the same troubles, the same sufferings, the same death, that he would face. Our twin knows what we will need thousands of years later. What we will need is not a God who can fool people with tricks and miracles and power plays. We need a God who knows something about fear, sorrow, sadness, loss, pain. We need a God who knows what it means to be scared to death by life. Marks in his hand and in his side are our Lord's credentials into the life that we face every day. Despite what the hymn says, we were not there when they crucified our Lord, or when they laid him in the grave, or when he came out, when he came forth out of the grave. We did not see it. And so we have to rely on the testimony of those who had the courage to demand to see it. It's only because of their courage and their confidence that we can have courage and confidence to claim the crucified and risen Christ of Nazareth as our Lord, our God. Like the disciples before us, today we are shut in so that we can save our lives. Tomorrow we will go out to find a brave, a brave new world. Today, the brave new world comes to us. Peace be with you.
spirit of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. of the people. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of resurrection, you are our source of life and hope. We give thanks for your gifts of love and life. Open our hearts and minds to hear your word and call. Inspire us to be your hands and voice in your world. Grant us courage and creativity to joyfully share your good news. We give thanks for your creation. Enable us to be educated, equipped, and inspired to be better stewards of your world. We give thanks for Earth Ministry and Lutherans Restoring Creation. We pray for our world, nation, and local communities. We lift up those communities where insecurity, violence, and fear are the norm. Help us to bring healing, wholeness, and safety to these siblings. We pray for those places, people, and animals in the wake of natural disasters, including our siblings in the southeastern states. Grant strength to those affected as they recover and rebuild. Help us to be generous partners with Lutheran disaster response. We pray for all who are in need of healing and strength. We lift up Dave, Kip, Ebony, Emily, Mike, Anthony, Lynette, Sheila, Claire, Carmine, Dan, Joanne, guests of the Community Meals Program, Sonia, Nicole, Josie, and Jeannie. We lift up those experiencing anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges. God, you call us to care for our neighbors. Inspire our leaders and guide us to be better advocates for the sake of each member in our community, especially those who have little power and no voice. We hold in prayer those affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Bring peace and comfort to the families of those who have died. Grant healing for those diagnosed. Keep safe those whose health conditions make them especially vulnerable to this virus. Protect medical workers, care providers, and first responders. Sustain chaplains who bring prayer and care to those hospitalized and in nursing homes. We give thanks for all non-medical essential workers who continue to serve our communities, providing food, medicine, safety, child care, and other vital services. Guide those working to improve testing and those working toward a vaccine and for our government and health organization leaders as they discern a path forward. Sustain those who are facing financial uncertainty due to loss of income. Help us to share generously. Bless our ministry leaders as they explore care-filled and creative ways to gather online for worship, prayer, and fellowship. We give thanks for the grace-filled support our leaders have shown one another. For all who are anxious and worried, ground us in facts and center us in your love and peace. During these days of physical isolation, grant us patience, humor, compassion, and courage. We pray for those who are grieving. Loving God, wrap your arms of love and hope around all who are experiencing any kind of loss, disconnection, or brokenness. We lift up the family.
family and friends of Barbara, Evelyn, Susan, and David. For what and for whom else do the people of God pray? We pray for your church. We give thanks for the leaders and participants in our church ministries. Grant them rest following Holy Week. May they be refreshed for the ministry opportunities ahead. We pray for the residents, staff, and families of nursing homes and care facilities, including those that are part of our Synod, Josephine Karen Community, Foss Home, Columbia Lutheran Home, Norse Home, and Hearthstone Community. Sustain us in our journey. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, restore, support, strengthen, and bless you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.